Hi everyone, I am so thrilled to be back for another Deck Creator Chat with Lauren, who is the creator of the Herbal and Spiced Culinary Tarot, which is currently on Kickstarter. Um, the deck is absolutely stunning, and I am so looking forward to chatting with Lauren about this. It's going to be awesome. Let me just send her an Go. Yay! I'm so excited. This deck is so stunning. Hi, Lauren! Hi! So nice. That was so fast. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you doing? So well. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. I've spent the last couple of days looking through all of the content that you provided on your deck on Kickstarter, and you'd also sent me um, some materials via email. And oh my gosh, it is so stunning. I'm so excited to have a chance to chat with you about it here. This is amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how the deck came to be. I know that you are a professional chef. And yeah, I was just wondering um, what your journey was to practice tarot to create the deck. Um, yeah, I thought maybe we could start with that. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I am a pretty new to tarot person. I would say I started about three years ago. And I do think that's important to this deck because I, I think there are certain things. I know there are other um, herbalism-based tarot decks out there. And I think if I had seen them, it would have influenced the way in which I made the deck. So I, was re I think that there was an element of beginner's mind that was really helpful to creating this deck because it is um, a deck that tells stories about food through the rider wing. So um, the idea came into my head fully formed mid-pandemic. Um, I was really grateful to bring it into the world. It was very easy to find my illustrator because it was, it was ready to come out. Like I, I said it before, I, I feel like it wasn't really my idea in so many ways because it came in so fully formed. Yeah, uh, Johnny's here too, so that's fun. Um, hi, Johnny. Uh, yeah, hi, so Johnny. Um, yeah, that's the deck tells the story of the Rider Way through culinary characters, um, food analogies, and then it also offers a way to cook or a thing to think about when you're eating during that time and mm -hmm. a, an herb or a spice that will help you. Yeah, I love that you've included that with each of the cards. Um, I'm a huge foodie. I have been my entire life. Um, I train in health and wellness, which I've moved away from almost entirely now. Um, but I also did a Ruby professional plant-based certification online, which I used to be very recipe book dri driven. And then after doing that course, it's allowed me to express my creativity in the kitchen and start experimenting with different things and pull different elements together. And I just like being someone who's so passionate about food, like going through your deck and looking at all of the references that you made um, and, and the major arcana. Oh my goodness. I love how you've re-envisioned each of the cards and the major arcana through the lens of food and being in a kitchen. And um, I, I would love to, yeah, ask you about that process of creating um, new ways of envisioning each of the cards um, through that lens and what that process was like for you. Because these, these associations that you've created, I was raving to my husband about it this morning about how perfect they are. Like they, they, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. So I'd love to hear more. Uh, to circle back a little, because you were talking about intuitive cooking and how you yeah. can cook it in the kitchen, and I do think that is a huge element of how I started this deck, or a precursor to this deck was me looking at recipes online and just thinking that none of the people who I knew who interacted yeah. with food in any way, any capacity professionally, it didn't reflect the way in which they cooked or yeah. the way in which, and that creativity is accessible to anyone if you teach them wow. how to go about it. So that yeah. was a big element of um, how I started as well. Um, yeah. And the major arcana, I think it's just, it really came out a, I wish there were a method, but there wasn't really because it is yeah. so imbued in my personality and mm -hmm. the stories that I have, have grown over the course of my career. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I think it goes back to that beginner mindset. It was, I think if I had overthought it or knew a little more, it would yeah. have ruined the process. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so I, it came out really, I would say the hardest one to put together was the oysters, which is the pentacles, but the major arcana came together pretty quickly. Um, there were maybe five cards that just like took a longer to came, come out. Um, I yeah. would say 
I, I wrote the deck between no October and November last year in May. Yep. And sitting for a minute was really helpful on some of them, just like walking yeah. away for a month or so. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally get that. And I think sometimes it's helpful as someone who overthinks all the things all the time, getting that distance from like the technical meaning of things or what it should be is so important as part of the creative process because then things can come through intuitively and it's more of a feeling rather than like, like adhering to rules, if, if that makes sense. Like I, I love, I love that it came out as such an organic kind of fully formed process. Like that's, I've talked to quite a few deck creators and that seems to be a really consistent theme for I think anybody engaging in the creative process to allow things to kind of flow through you almost or, you know, create something in an organic way. That's really amazing. Yeah, there was a couple of the associations that you had made that I really appreciated because I've been a stay at home mom for like, well, since my daughter was born, she'll be 14 uh, in December. And your re-envisioning of, I think it was the Empress card as a domestic genius was like, I love that so much. Um, and also the burnt souffle for the tower was like, I, I love that because it's so true with the tower card and those tower moments that like rip you apart. And so often there's so much that you invest into creating something. And when it's something as finicky as a souffle, to have it burn in the end is so devastating, right? So I just loved that you had that association. It made so much sense to me. That's, that's really, really cool. Yeah, originally the domestic genus was the domestic goddess, and I, I love, and it changed. I mean, we live in a time when we have amazing ways to re-envision gender, and so it yeah. just didn't, it didn't quite, as fun as, like, tongue-in-cheek as goddesses, yeah. like, I love the way in which Nisa interpreted that picture, yeah. too. It's really great, and um, so that was a fun one, and I'm glad it got to the heart of the matter, because the home is so yeah. important. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the burnt souffle, there, I hope there is this, like, goofy element, because yeah. when, when you ruin something, it does feel like the end of the world. It does. It's gutting when you put so much time and energy into something, especially with food. Like, the smallest thing can kind of set it off, especially when it comes to bake times, right? Like, once you've crossed that threshold of burning something, like, there's really no coming back from that, right? So it was just, yeah, I love that so much. Yeah, but you can always start over. Like, it's so easy. It's like, okay, start over. Like, do yeah. it again. You, yeah. you learn something, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you definitely do. Um, and I love that you envision death as compost. Because that really embodies the energy of that card. And, and the thing that I love about that whole cycle, like, death is so much about death and then rebirth, right? It's about what comes next. It's not like an ending point as much as a lot of people see it to be, right? Like there's a sense of it's being turned over into something that then will help with future growth, right? Like I just love that that was um, how you had set it up. Yeah. And actually you'd already asked, answered a question that I was gonna ask about which suit or cards were the most difficult. And you'd mentioned the pentacles. Um, and I love that you picked oysters for that particular suit. And you'd mentioned a quote in the Kickstarter about how um, oysters have opulence, survival and resourcefulness, which is the perfect way of encapsulating the energy of pentacles too, right? Like that. So what was the, what was the creation process for that particular suit like? I, I think that is something, like I was saying earlier, it was pretty organic, but there were some things you just kind of had to trust and sit on. Yeah. Um, and so that was a, when we, because oysters are such like a food person, that even, um, yes. and like even, I know some vegans do eat it because there's no central nervous system. So there is that yeah. element of that. And so, and I think um, as I've, anyone who gets more into food, you would inevitably become interested in the source of where it comes from, which is sort mm -hmm. of like the, the pipeline from wellness to spirituality, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. So that, that was the start, I would say. And then it, there were some cards that were very natural. Like I very much so deep in my personality is like Alice in Wonderland um, and growing yeah. up with that book. And so the five yeah. pentacles had to be the walrus and the carpenter um, and him like crying over the oysters. <laughs> um, and like, I do remember being young, a young cook in New York City and being like, oh, I'll know I've made it when I can eat a seafood tower. And yeah, I've still yeah. never made even the seafood tower, <laughs> but like that, that nine of pentacles energy is very much so. I hope that, you know, there are different ways yeah. in which I interpret it now, but 
um, yeah, and just doing doing very light research and just being in awe of how many different ways there are to go. There are so many stories about oysters. I learned so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think they're known as an aphrodisiac too, weren't they? So there's like this whole element of abundance in all areas that's associated with it, which is, yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, my brother's uh, trained as a chef. He went to the Stratford Chef School and he works now. He does kind of private catering events because um, he's also involved in music production. But I know like for him, oysters are like a mark of like the big deal, right? Like it's something that he really lives for. And anytime he gets to the East or West Coast, he gets really excited because of the oysters, right? It's like a, it's a big thing. So yeah, I think there's also an element of ritual around it too for people that are really into it like it's definitely very much a treat so that's really cool yeah and then I noticed um you have the wands as mushrooms which is awesome so tell me more about that um so I think an interesting element and I talked in a different interview about this about this deck mm -hmm. is I do think there was a big break in traditional understandings of earth wind fire and air in the minor mm -hmm. arcana um, yeah and I do think there is this super natural element to mushrooms and reverence mm -hmm. insofar as both, I mean, medicinally beyond psilocybin adaptogens. Yeah. Um, and that was an element, but I loved the idea of, um, or do you, have you ever read, I forget the name, Taro, I don't know his last name, of Four Sigmatic or listen to him speak. Yeah, yeah, I have. And actually, I trained with um, uh, Harmonic Arts on Vancouver Island and got really into medicinal mushrooms. And actually, I'm drinking a latte right now. And I added their um, five mushroom blend that so has a bit of chaga and reishi and cordyceps, uh, turkey tail and lion's mane. Um, and it's incredible how powerful these mushrooms are. Like when I walked away from health and wellness, I, I felt really jaded by the industry and just a lot of the messaging is really toxic and it's very elitist, like it's not accessible to so many people. And I just felt really um, disconcerted by all of those things once I kind of opened my eyes to it. But one of the things, I have kept a few things and the medicinal mushrooms are something that we use regularly in our cooking, like for soup stock, they throw a little bit in my coffee just because they're so, they feel so nourishing to me, you know, and I love the adaptogenic properties and it's so helpful during a pandemic and you know mushrooms are such powerful well fungi I guess food food sources I guess is the best word and it's so interesting to look I have a deck that I bought through harmonic arts that that has it's just a playing card deck but it looks at um mushrooms it's different suits and then I think it's the spades that's all the poisonous mushrooms and there's like a whole and then there's also like hallucinogenic magic mushrooms like it runs the gamut in terms of what kind of energy you can get from them right and and I mean, there's so many studies that have been done around shiitake mushrooms and different things and the health benefits. And I don't know about you, but there's just something so nourishing about sitting down with a warm cup or bowl of mushroom soup. You know, it's got that umami and that kind of grounded energy, right? Which is so awesome. Yeah, I think there, I, a hundred percent. So, so you get it. I mean, there's this fixation, <laughs> I think. I mean, I don't know anyone. It, it, people just... I think there are so many ways to look at mushrooms, um, mm -hmm. both, like you said, medicinally, from a nourishing standpoint, from a taste yeah. standpoint. Um, also, a, an interesting uh, fascination that I found as I was doing a little bit of research for the deck was mm -hmm. often mushrooms grow, or there are very prized mushrooms that grow, especially in the wake of destruction. Like that yeah. is where they bloom. And so that yeah, idea yeah. of I mean, we were talking about compost earlier, that spiralic nature that many wonderful um, tarot teachers talk about. That's very yeah. evident in mushrooms. And so I like the idea of um, looking at the wand as uh, divinely inspired action. Like you move yeah. forward and we will support you. And that's yeah. really what I think of mushrooms and fungi on this earth as. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love that energy. Yeah, because there's such growth and potential, but it's such a supportive energy around that where mushrooms are concerned. So it's, yeah, oh, I love that so much. Um, and, and it's so interesting now, I, I would never forage mushrooms because it's one of those things that can be fairly dicey. Like you really have to know know your stuff when it comes to foraging. So I, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough or brave enough to embark on that without a whole lot more knowledge. Um, but it's interesting when we go on hikes sometimes because I'll notice 
that looks a lot like reishi or, you know, that could be some chaga growing on that birch bark there, you know, like, and it's so interesting to be able to start identifying different things and see different environments where they'll grow, right? Like mushrooms will thrive in environments where a lot of other plants wouldn't. So it's really interesting. There's that sense of like perseverance that's associated with them too, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, and I do think there is that element, like I know at least for lion's mane, everything yeah. that looks like lion's mane is edible in my, I mean, somebody, yeah. could, I'm some idiot on the internet is always what I say when I'm talking about these things, like research it for yourself, but like yeah. for anyone listening, but I'm fairly certain at least lion's mane, everything that's lion's mane looking is edible. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Like there's definitely some that are safer and more easily identifiable and there isn't like a version of it that is more toxic, right? Like it, yeah, I mean, and I know so many people that do forage mushrooms and it's the ritual for them and they've got their specific spots and I would never want to take away from it. Just for me personally, I definitely proceed with caution just because I don't have that knowledge base, right? Um, but yeah, no, they're they're incredible, um, <clears throat> an absolutely incredible food source. It's wonderful. <clears throat> and then when you look at the energetic, excuse me, a frog in my throat, when you look at the energetics of food, um, it's really interesting to look at different food groups as well and see what, uh, from an energetic perspective, you can get from it. I, I work with a lot of herbs as well. And it's so interesting when you engage with different things and, and how um, the energetic of something like lavender can be very relaxing. Other things are more energizing. Some are supportive for hormones. Like it's, it's really cool when you dove, dive into it past the food level, right? Like it, yeah, super interesting. And that's why I love that you included um, herbal associations with all of the cards, because I think that's a way for people to step into embracing the energetics and the flavors of foods as they relate to tarot, um, which is, yeah, that's super exciting. Yeah, I think at first I had this interesting, I wanted it to mostly be medicinal, and I'm glad when I stopped trying to force that and made it more back into the culinary world. A lot yeah. of them are medicinal. I mean, there's so many, mm -hmm. there's, you know, seven, over the course of 78 herbs, you get to yeah. a lot of options. But I became really fascinated as I continued um, researching with the folklore of herbs and the way in which that can be a way of imbuing what you're making with intention. Um, mm -hmm. And so we haven't gotten to this part yet, but the idea of kitchen witch has been something that's very much so on my brain as I was making mm -hmm. this. And the first time I heard the phrase, I had this like very misogynistic reaction to it where I was like, well, I don't want to be that kind of witch. And which is so funny because that was my real house and where I live and spend all my time. And I think it's when you discuss your wonderful relationship with food professionally and the idea of like a domestic genius as opposed to like yeah. a chef. Yeah. They, you know, why do we, we should never value one over the other. It's ridiculous. And so mm -hmm. um, I think as I got more into the folklore of herbs and doing that element, um, that became an incredibly, incredibly important part of the story I was telling. Yeah, there's so much magic in food. Like you, most people eat three times a day at least. And I, I just like, I get my, I homeschool my kids and I get them in the kitchen with me as much as humanly possible and get them involved when picking out our, you know, we get a food box every week and we get to kind of custom choose with the local organic farm and they get really excited about Brussels sprouts and broccoli and various, you know, like um, we just got um, a Romanesco um, cauliflower and it's so exciting because it's such a beautiful vegetable, right? And I get them in the kitchen with me and we work on different preparation techniques and, you know, work on their knife skills and everything. And that's very much part of our homeschooling. And it makes me so happy that they're able to connect in a positive way with what goes into their body and get excited about trying new things. And I mean, that being said, my son's going through a bit of a selective phase right now with, you know, one thing will be fine and then the next day it's not, he's nine. So, you know, that's his prerogative. But I feel like the more I can get him in the kitchen with me, the more there's excitement and connection because it's something that you do multiple times a day. So if you can find a source of joy and connection to it, I think there's something really special about that, you know? And um, yeah, so you're trained as a, a professional chef. So tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Um, so I worked, I don't know how I ended up here, but it was sort of always what I was going to end up doing, I think. Yeah. Um, everyone always says in retrospect, oh, we knew. And I said, oh, <laughs> okay. But so I moved to New York City and I was determined, I thought I would maybe end up in magazines or something like that. 
it is hard to get those jobs out of the gate without a connection. And I didn't even really try. I don't know why. I, I really, I went right into restaurants and I wanted to be really good at what I did. I was really um, obsessed with legitimacy, mm -hmm. which the interesting lesson on that as everyone will probably or many people will learn in whatever their field is is that you never really feel good enough um there's a question down as soon as i'm done with this somebody asked something but um yeah so i spent towards the end i hit the top level i was gonna hit i was working at michelin yeah. star restaurants um it was very cutthroat and i felt like a huge imposter and my i started wearing out so yeah. I, um, as I wore out, I had to start over and I fell very quickly into the wellness world. Now to circle back before I started cooking, I was a comparative religion major in college and I didn't, I grew up, you know, in suburbia, there weren't a lot of people doing, you know, having spiritual practices or witchcraft or whatever. And so coming back, it, it felt like religion, like a comparative religion degree where I was studying religions internationally was sort of as close mm -hmm. at the time as I was going to get to that. So, yeah. um, you know, I went through this period of time where I was cooking in private homes and food styling. And I was like, okay, maybe I really want to be a healer, but at the same time, it's like pursuing anything else. I was like, but how yeah. do I still cook? Um, yeah. and so yeah. that's sort of my experience in a nutshell. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I got in, I studied in health and wellness and I, I um, was really passionate about it for a few years. And then, like I said, I started to kind of become more aware of the problematic aspects of the industry. And I also got into a situation where I was dealing with a lot of orthorexia and fixation on what was healthy and what wasn't. And it's taken a lot and a huge step back from all of that to get to a good place with that anymore, where I can drink a cup of coffee and not worry about it. You know, I have a croissant and I enjoy it, right? Like it really sucked the joy out of food for me. Um, and I don't know that this is kind of off topic, but I'm trying to find my way back to my passion and joy for creating recipes and food through the lens of astrology and tarot. You know, I'm finding that that's, that's my way back. So I can look at what food correspondences are there, there are for a specific sign and then channel my creativity through that. And it feels more organic and more, um, it allows me to, to connect with it intuitively rather than by some kind of rule book of what I should or shouldn't do, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, it's interesting how so much to do with food can be a journey, right? And it's a progression of you start in one place and then end up somewhere completely different. And it, yeah. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, I think a bit, I relate 100% to what you're saying, where I think a huge element of, or a huge barometer in my life of where I am mentally is how much I enjoy eating. And if I don't enjoy eating anymore, then I really need to go back to the drawing board. Um, yeah. And that has happened on multiple occasions. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for so. sure. I think in a lot of cases with health and wellness, there can be a very reductionist approach to food, like certain things are good and certain things are bad. And then you wait a week and a new study comes out and it says that that thing last week that was supposed to be so good, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's, it's so contradictory and it can be very um, restrictive in terms of focusing on the joy right because there's so much joy to be had in food and the preparation of it and the sharing of it with other people like I love your world card and it has the feast and it's this feeling of abundance and sharing and people coming together like that was really the impression that I got from that card and I love it so much you know it's really amazing um also I love that you kept the cups the cup because um there's so much um celebration and connection and emotion connected to the things that we drink, whether it's um, a glass of bubbly to celebrate something, a morning coffee ritual or whatever manifestation. I love the 10 of cup card and it's like the latte with the perfect latte art in it. And it's just beautiful. So yeah, what was the process like for that particular suit? Um, I just think food is such a natural part of beverage. It, food and beverage go together and I'm not gonna fight what came naturally yet again. Um, huh. I'm definitely one of those ADHD people with like 10 beverages surrounding them at all times like I, I have a <laughs> thing here uh I'm not ready to go if I don't have that and so um it was a natural element and so the idea and I wanted it to be um playful and fun that sort of tongue-in-cheek sort of 
thing. So a lot, I don't drink coffee anymore simply because I can't hang like, but I love, I wish I did. I still have a good association with it. Um, yeah, yeah. And like, I love the idea of that like comfort legacy thing where it yeah, does boost yeah. you. So that, that was a card that was really special to me in that regard. And mm -hmm. yeah, I tried to make it, there are some alcohol based cards, but there are so many beverages that aren't alcohol based. So, and yeah. I think in the case, like, I don't think you have to drink to understand what champagne represents and yeah, exactly. and it's okay if you don't drink it, you still get it. So like yeah, that, exactly. that was an important element of what I was doing. Yeah. And I quit drinking when my son was born. I have alcoholism in my family and I just decided it wasn't a good thing for me moving forward. But I still appreciate the cards and the energy of it and the festival of celebration. I mean, I could get a bubbly apple cider and it would, you know, embody that same characteristic. It's a ritual of celebration that I think is imbued in that card and that representation that is so powerful, right? And it's, it's really lovely because so many times people come together to celebrate something and they have something special to drink, whatever that happens to be, right? And there's this powerful ritual and coming together and idea of celebration around that that I think is really magical and uh, yeah, quite amazing. Um, and I love that your sword suit is tools and that you run the gamut with so many different aspects of food and cooking. Like I think um, you have a meat tenderizer. Was that mm, I, the, the three swords? Yeah, yeah. And I, I love that. Like there's so many different tools and elements that come into play with food and cooking. And some of them are a little sharper than others and proceed with caution and all of that, right? And it, it fits that energy of the threes so beautifully. So yeah, I'm curious how that particular suit came together as well. Well, I think when we're talking about, there's a couple of cards I'll bring up in particular in relation to that suit. But so to start the idea of the Ace of Tools, a toolkit, mm -hmm. and you get to decide how you think about something. So you pull out whatever tool you want. And I think that there is that element of that. And then I think when we talk about swords being a double-edged sword, where it's either this or that, yeah. um, I think that it's the same with like tools, we think of it efficient, but they're like, they are a form of violence, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like the meat absolutely. tenderizer, you're, you're banging things out. It has, <laughs> but it, with a, it serves a purpose. Yeah. So um, I just thought, or the, I love thinking of, this was where I broke from traditional again with um, the five was fire. And we yeah. rarely think of fire as the first technology. So mm -hmm. going back to those roots and thinking of it as a tool instead of just simply as an element. Um, yeah, that was, that was the general principle behind it is look at this tool, but also think about the damage that it could incur. Yeah. Yeah, I love that because it brings in both sides of the sword. Like, I don't believe that any card is inherently positive or negative. There's always two sides to it. And I love that engaging with tools, like a nice sharp knife, is a great tool for cooking, but it can go sideways very quickly. Although I would argue that a dull knife is far more dangerous. But even so, like it's, it, there's these things and, and there's this inherent respect that you have to have for the tools that you use, right? Because they need to be um, respected. And it's the same thing with swords. It's like your thought patterns and your experiences can help you with growth, but they can also be painful. So it's like tempering those things and those elements a little bit, right? Yeah, no, I love that. So did you have a favorite suit to work on? Um, I would, I mean, I would say the oysters and the mushrooms just because I'm, you know, a food person. So that was really, yeah, yeah. really fun for me, both of those. I mean, I think everyone's your favorite when you're working on it, though. Yeah, um, absolutely. Really, really, I would say everyone's your favorite. It was interesting because at first I really enjoyed working on the majors when I was starting. And then when I left them alone for a minute and I went to the minors, I thought that the re like I really enjoyed doing the research portion and so mm -hmm. when I had to go back to just like mental associations instead of hard like oh here's a story about the matsutake mushroom or whatever that was yeah. yeah that was an interesting I was not expecting to feel that that way where it was like oh this has to come exclusively from my brain like <laughs> yeah so that that was an interesting um balance between the two but I I mean I know Nisa really enjoyed drawing the mushrooms a lot. That was really fun for her when we started. And I mean, I, I know she enjoyed drawing all the deck, but that was, yeah. I mean, that was probably the first cornerstone that fell into place. 
Absolutely. Well, and mushrooms are so visually interesting. Like you look at a maitake mushroom. We found when we lived in Halifax, we moved a year ago today, actually, to a small town in Nova Scotia, but we were living in Halifax and there was a Maritime Gourmet Mushroom Company and they would come out with different mushrooms like every week. Not every week. They had staples, but they had like the maitake and they had the lion's mane and shiitakes and just this whole gamut. And they're so visually interesting. Like I can see why that would be a real draw for an illustrator to engage with that because it is so so interesting um, to play around with in terms of shapes and forms and stuff. That's really cool. I'm dying to go to Halifax. My sun line goes right through Halifax and I realized ah. it's going to get during uh, the pandemic and I was like, how, yeah. I, how do I get to, I got to wait until, you know, quarantine yeah. changes a bit, but got to get to Halifax. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. Like we, um, we were renting a really shitty apartment. So our living situation wasn't great and real estate's really expensive there. So we ended up going to a small town because we could afford it. But there's so much that I miss about the city. Like I appreciate the slower pace and the fact that when I go to bed at night, it's quiet. But there's so much, like I get really excited whenever we get to go into the city because there's, it's, it's a beautiful spot and there's just so much at your fingertips and it's, you know, yeah, it's a pretty special place. So definitely highly recommend it. <laughs> Um, I, if you wouldn't mind, I would actually love to go through all the major arcana because I, I, like I said earlier, I really love what you picked for each of the cards. And I think it, I'd love to get your insights on all of that. Um, if, if that works for you. Um, yeah, cause it's so lovely. So, uh, for the full card, you have the state. So that would be, um, someone who is doing all the final touches on plating. Is that? The stash is someone who, um, doesn't get paid and who shows oh, okay. up and it's like, there is this sort of like Pollyanna aspect, like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, a, a good friend of mine who is a costume designer. Mm -hmm. And this really like, in what she said, what I'm about to say, like embodies this cynicism of like uh -huh. my mid twenties halfway through it. But like people coming into her seamstress shop and be like, wow, what's that? And she'd be like, it's a sewing machine. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, or me, people being like, wow, what are you doing? It's like, it's a ladle. Like, yeah, you've yeah. seen a ladle before. So like, yeah. there is that element of just being so excited to be in a kitchen, but um, yeah. you don't necessarily know what you're getting in for. It is, it is literally day one. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I have a background in theater and when I was doing my undergrad, uh, and actually, when I was at theater school in New York, too, I, I volunteered for all of the backstage stuff. I helped with costumes. I volunteered at the, well, I think I was paid position at the library. But I was just so excited to be there. And I just wanted to be part of it all. And I was working backstage in my undergrad. And it was this really prestigious university where everybody was, like, very elitist and snobby. And so you end up treated like shit on somebody's shoe. And it was just such a a demoralizing experience because I was trying so hard and I was so excited to be there, but then my actual experience ended up being a bit disheartening. So it's interesting with these things. It's like, there's that level of excitement and new adventure, but then it can also be um, challenging sometimes too. Right. And yeah. And there is a level of um, under like being, once you are a little world weary, like probably if you, you know, just, I'm sure a step up on the ring backstage sure. and you'd be like, yeah, we, we're a little gruff back here. You know what I mean? There yeah. is a, there is something slightly, there's something to be so compassionate and excited for because that is an amazing stage of one's life, but it also is like, yeah. all right, what are you thinking? Like, yeah. <laughs> what do you think this would be like? Well, and it was also like, I didn't want to work in the backstage. I wanted to perform, right? Like that was, so it was like trying to make my way into that environment, but not in the way that I truly wanted to be there. So it was like this interesting dynamic of like finding your space and what you truly want to be doing versus what you are doing and wanting to contribute, but it's not in the ways you, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting stage to be in and, and just like my, my optimism and my sense of, um, yeah, excitement. It's very much that, that full energy that's really encapsulated with that. And I love that you have the magician as a um, molecular gastronomist. Um, my brother was obsessed with Heston Blumenthal and went to the Fat Duck and experienced all of that. And there's an amazing restaurant in Stratford called, um, well, it used to be called The Church, I think it is. And my husband and I used to go to the festival every year to watch plays. And we went there for lunch one day. And, and just like the pure magic of molecular gastronomy is the, the textures and everything else is just pure magic. And I love that you used um, the magician for that because that's such a great analogy for that form of cooking. Yeah, I, I mean, 
So I was really excited for that one. Um, still am. I think there's this element of even if you aren't involved in molecular gastronomy, I know the food yeah. that I chose for that is, um, it's like, I don't know if you've ever been to one of those old school restaurants where they make a Caesar salad in front of you or, they yeah, yeah. It, or like will light a cherry's Jubilee. Like there's a yeah. showmanship to food that's yeah. amazing. But also mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are skeptical about molecular gastronomy and think it's like too flashy rather than food. So it really gets yeah. to the heart of the matter perfectly where it's like, oh, isn't it cool that I can like suspend this egg yolk? And it's like, yeah. okay, it, but is that food? In yeah. my mind, yes, but like, yeah there is that sort of um, debate. Oh, for sure. Um, but there's this element of artistry that goes into it too, that I've always been so intrigued by, right? Like taking the texture of something and transforming it into something else. And if that's not magician energy, like it so perfectly encapsulates that. Um, and yeah, there's there's so many debates around food and what is food. And I mean, there's always those stupid, I know there was an A&W ad where somebody went out for like fine dining and then they had to stop for a burger afterwards because they were still hungry and like all of that kind of mentality around fine dining, which, yeah, yeah anyway, <laughs> it's a bit ridiculous. But um, yeah, I, I love that you have the high priestess as the gardener too. That's really lovely. So tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, I think the idea... I just am in awe of gardeners generally. Yeah. I think that they do incredible work and it's, it is, it's a lot of work to get started, but I, the gardeners mm -hmm. aren't doing it for us. Like yeah. they're not, they're doing it for them yeah. and they're doing it yeah. for their plants. So I yeah. think that idea of sort of just joy and in sitting in silence really comes through strongly and that, that I am especially fond. I love the little crocs on um, the yes, oh my one. gosh, I yeah. noticed that detail, it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah she, did a, she did a great job with the, yeah. uh, and I love the way Nisa draws vegetables, so I like especially oh, fond of that card, um, yeah. I think it's beautiful, and yeah, the idea of just going from the showman, I think the contrast of like the molecular gastronomer who is showing off a bit, um, yeah. because they can, and that's amazing, yeah. but like that in contrast with the gardener is um, really like a a special movement through the cards. Yeah, and I think there's a stillness, like you said, and a tranquility that comes with gardening that really encapsulates that energy of the high priestess too. And it is such a contrast from the showmanship of a magician, right? Whether it's in traditional tarot or in this particular deck with the molecular gastronomy, and I love that. We already touched on the domestic genius, but again, I adore that card. It's so fabulous. And I love that, I mean, there's a lot of men that are choosing to stay home with their kids now too. And so it opens up the possibility for it to be a manifestation of either gender, right? And I think that that's wonderful. And as much as like, I always think of Nigella Lawson with like the domestic goddess thing, but this just opens it up more. And I love that it brings that sense of genius home to something that you do in your kitchen at home, right? And it can be your own sense of playfulness and sense of adventure. And I love that that's the Empress card because there's something so nurturing about fostering that in yourself, right? Um, yeah, that's so great. Yeah, uh, I, it's so funny because when you said Nigella Lawson, that was also like my <laughs> first thought. And there is something kind of like goof, I mean, it's like, it is, so domestic goddessy, but there's something that's so over the top about that. But um, yeah. I did like, I enjoyed re-envisioning it tremendously, especially, I mean, it's funny that we're having this conversation today because the debate mm -hmm. on paternity leave in America is just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't even, I don't know what they're thinking. Um, but so it's, it's, I do think it's important to see, to portray mm -hmm. men doing things like that. Oh, absolutely. And it was funny because I was saying to Dominic, like, I love that. I think there's like a little baby in a carrier too, right? Like that was quite literally me with all three of my kids, like basically tucking them in so that they could nap while I busily chopped and prepared food. And it was like, I just love that, that it's encapsulating all aspects of your life and that image. Right. And it, yeah just so good and and yeah like you said it's very pertinent with the debates currently around paternity leave and and everything else because it's ridiculous that it's not an equal opportunity thing you know and and um i love that the card opens up a more expensive interpretation of that right um and i love the emperor as the chef right like the top boss in the restaurant and and all of that yeah that's that's really awesome i had a yeah that was one that fell into place very early and I still have like not healed my relationship entirely with the idea of chef 
or yeah. emperor, ironically. Yeah. So that's like sort of a- I have trouble I, with that part too. Uh, yeah. yeah, it really, it's something that's a huge struggle for me. So I definitely wrote the reversal before I wrote through it. Like before yeah. I even knew that reversals were gonna be part of the deck, like there yeah. were some negative things to come out on that card. But um, yeah. I think a great chef can be the highest representation of that where they have order yeah. and they're a caretaker and a teacher and they follow rules. Um, but the other half of it is there's, I mean, there's a lot of people who rule with an iron fist because they're yeah. insecure. So, yeah, and the, the, the element of the emperor and all of that can come into play. Yeah, no, I love that so much. Yeah, I struggle with the emperor too. It's actually ironically my birth card. And um, <laughs> I was like, really? Um, but over the course of 2020, because it was an emperor year, I took some time to kind of dive into that card and force myself to see the positive elements because prior to that, I was always focused on the negative side of that particular card. But again, like I said earlier, nothing is either one way or the other. So it was helpful and healing to be able to look at the positives and the ways that those manifest in my life. And you're right, when it comes to chefs, I mean, there's a stereotype about, you know, the Gordon Ramsays of the world. <laughs> but, uh, but there are also people that take on the mentorship role and are very supportive and implement rules as a safety element which is so important in the kitchen too right so yeah that's really really cool and for um, what it's worth actually gordon ramsay has a like i with a, i'll tell positive gossip instead of negative gossip like there yeah, are people that. saying nice nice things about him when he's off camera like there yeah. would be good things and i my last yeah. chef was a sous chef for gordon ramsay for yeah eight eight years or something like that and he yeah. i mean he was very talented they they yeah. did their thing but Oh, yes, yeah. that that I mean, I don't think putting that archetype of someone screaming out into the world and the public is really doing anyone any favors, but no. he, he's supposed to be very respectful to staff. Oh, yeah. And it's interesting because I say that um, and that's the public persona that's kind of associated. But we did the master class um, courses with my kids and it was all Gordon Ramsay. I mean, he's swearing left, right and center. And I just was like, yeah, kids, you know, you're not supposed to do this, right? And they're like, yeah, but the joy that he has with food and the engagement with it and the banter that he had with the people that he was working with. And we watched, you know, Master Chef Junior. And I've seen him in other capacities where I can see how brilliant he is in so many ways and, and the care that he gives people that he works with too, right? So it's like, there's a lot of positives as well. It's just like, there's this kind of persona that I think has been put out through various Hell's Kitchen and everything else that encapsulates that more negative aspect. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, we, we kind of have a lot of love for Gordon Ramsay, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, and the Hierophant is the farmer. I love that association. Yeah, I think uh, thinking of the farmer and the Hierophant in many ways is the backbone of civilization, thinking of it yeah. as a translator for the good of the people. Um, and I know that that's often a card that people struggle with as well, mm -hmm. that hyper masculine energy. And I think that there's, I mean, there's an opportunity to re envision it. Yeah. In, in that farmer. The farmer yeah. had to be part of the deck. So yeah. and I couldn't imagine anywhere else. Well, and there's, there's such a, an association with growth and development. And I feel like that's the elevated version of the Hierophant where you have someone who's a mentor and is working with you and you can kind of learn from each other and help each other grow. And there's that kind of engagement with farming and interaction with the land that helps facilitate growth and movement that's really quite nurturing, right? Um, yeah, the Hierophant is the other card that I really struggled with um, in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, we're in Hierophant year now and I've kind of managed to heal some of that, which is lovely. Um, and the lover's card is a picnic. I love that so much. That's such a lovely energy. Yeah, I just think there's no more magical moment, whether it's with your entire family or mm -hmm. with someone you know, or even if you take yourself out to a picnic, it's such a special moment with someone you care about. And it is, yeah. it is the right amount of romance. And I know, I just think it's, it's a perfect moment. I know that there's some interpretations of the lovers that are about putting someone on a pedestal. Um, yeah. But I think there's a, I just think there was a moment to just sit back and enjoy, enjoy. Yeah. yeah, food, love, life. Absolutely. No, I love that energy so much. And it's so encapsulated in that picnic card. I love it. Um, and then the chariot, I wanted to ask you about this, is the vegan. I'd love to hear more. Yeah, I think, um, I just think the chariot is, I, it's a card that I am fascinated by. I love the energy of that. And I think that um, a vegan is someone who, it's not 
yeah, it's so easy. It's pretty, let me start over. I was about to say, it's so easy to be a vegan now. It's still not easy to be a vegan, but I do, it's easier than it used to be, but it, it takes a lot of fortitude to say, these are, this is what I stand for. And I, I'm not eating that way anymore. So, um, yeah, I think that that's where I was coming from. And I just think even if somebody, I know there's a lot of skepticism in the mainstream towards vegans to still, and it's like, well, <laughs> take a moment to, to consider the ways in which somebody has like made a decision for their life that feels aligned to their values, because that's an incredibly bold decision. And one that I think all of us struggle with on some level. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting. Like I said, we've been vegan for 11 and a half years and it made us very much social pariahs on both sides of our family. And there's a lot of kind of interesting dialogue around that. And like, I would never push it on anybody else. Like I do it because it works for me and I have flexibility. Like every so often I'll have some fish or someone prepares something for me and it's made with love. I'll try it, of course, right? Because there's so much love that goes into food that's prepared for you. And I, I get an indigenous um, box subscription and there was some jerky in there and it was bison jerky and I was really intrigued and my daughter was intrigued. She'd never tried it before. So we had it and it was delicious and it was wonderful. And it was so amazing to engage with something that was created with so much love and consideration and care, right? And so, um, but yeah, like 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what we follow. And it's, it's. Um, I love how you articulated that. That makes so much sense to me as someone who is doing that most of the time. Like it's, yeah, that's very cool. Um, so, and then strength, you had the line cook. And I'd love to hear more about that. I know that can be a challenging position in a kitchen, having heard lots of stories from my brother, for sure. Yeah, I think, but also, I think the interesting thing about lion cooks is if you're doing it well, mm -hmm. you're part of a team and you're helping yeah, someone absolutely. else. So it is a community-based yeah. thing and there is mm -hmm. a humility to strength because you're mm -hmm. never going to get any of the credit. That's yeah. not what you're there for. You're there to do the job. And so I think that there is an element of, uh, I, I'm going to miss, I'm going to botch this quote, but like but after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Uh, chop wood, carry water. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I so that I think it is that, like, yeah. I think there is an element. I, when I was in a line cook, I had this mentality of sort of like a Game of Thrones taking the black situation. It's like, <laughs> you don't have this, you don't have yeah. that. You need to show yeah. up to work. And there was an element of that at the time that was incredibly yeah. appealing to me to yeah. just be so in it all the time. So I think that, yeah. that that strength is just keeping your head down. Yeah. And there's a strength in being the support person too, right? Because there's none of the glory, there's none of the recognition necessarily, but you're play paying a key, playing rather a key and integral role in the function of the kitchen and getting food on the table and helping everything work together as a well-oiled machine as a group, right? So that's, yeah, I love that so much. Um, okay, so yeah, the Hermit Table for One is like, I adore that, that is absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, tell me more. <laughs> it's so funny because uh, Nisa just has such a magical like talent for faces and I don't think she's done a lot of work like so I had seen a lot of her illustrations going in, but she hadn't drawn yeah. a lot of people. And so yeah. I'm super glad she got an, uh, an opportunity to showcase her real talent for creating characters. Um, yeah. and Cause I think that that card in particular, is so funny cause it happens to look like someone I know very well. <laughs> um, but we, I mean, I don't, I don't know where she came up with these people, but so yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's an element of, I think a lot, I've always enjoyed eating by myself. It's my favorite yeah. thing to do. I get very bothered if people bother me at the bar when I'm trying to eat by myself. Um, yeah. But a lot of people struggle with that. And so yeah. an element of like, take this opportunity to really enjoy your own company. Yeah, absolutely. There's a power in that. Um, when I was in theater school in New York, I used to go out and eat by myself all the time. And sometimes I would bring a book with me to make it look less awkward because sometimes people would kind of look at you or whatever else. But I really leaned into that experience. And when I saw that card, I was like, oh, I know that so well. It is such a special experience. Like you said, having that time with yourself to just sit down and enjoy a meal uninterrupted is really beautiful. You know, it's yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, and then uh, the Wheel of Fortune is a food critic. Tell me about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I've been in, I've been through many New York Times reviews in my career. I, like, at least two and a half times yeah. um, cycles. And um, it is really, you can put everything into it, but you don't know how people are going to receive it or like it. And you kind of just have to yeah. accept that you've done the work and you're moving on. Uh, yeah. And I do think there's that element of feeling, okay, so I pulled this card, that card specifically for a friend recently, and he was like, that's so funny, because that's the opposite of what I would do in any situation. But I do think the yeah. interesting thing about the Wheel of Fortune for me is, okay, I've done everything I possibly can. Like, you, yeah. you, you did what you could. So yeah. you prepare. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lack of control that comes with that card. I think it, it's oftentimes things that are impacting you and there's this need to go with the flow and accept that, okay, I did the best I could, like you said, and then move forward, right? There's that cyclical nature of it. And I, I feel like that food critic really encapsulates the energy of that card beautifully. Um, and then justice as the forager. I love that so much because there's the food justice aspect of that and, and, you know, applying and using everything that's available to you. That's, that's really, really cool. So yeah, tell me more. <laughs> yeah, I love that card. And I love that the mushrooms and the ramps came back around on that image. Yeah. Um, I think I wanted to incorporate foragers in some capacity because it was important mm -hmm. that it wasn't just restaurant people, it, you know, it's yeah. the whole system. Um, and I think that uh, insofar as the forager, I think there's an element of, you were talking earlier about your friends and they have their specific spots. Yeah, mm -hmm. you got to leave enough so that it replenishes. That's yeah. like the element of justice. So not only is it free from the earth, but it's, yeah. um, you know, have good etiquette, care about, yeah. care about regeneration. Um, yeah. it, it was a, that was a natural piece to fall in for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's a sense of stewardship that comes with it, like you said, because you're wanting to make sure that you're leaving enough that you can come back the next year and other people can partake. And there's a sense of community and fairness that's associated with it, which is such a key part of the justice card, right? I love that so much. Um, and I love that the hanged one is the picky eater. Um, yeah, that, that's such a great interpretation of that. That was the first card I think that came into play. And that was when I sent my, when I sent Nisa, my illustrator, a list of like, here's what I was thinking. That yeah. was the one that stuck out to her very early as a oh, fun right. one. Um, and it was cool because initially when we were drawing it, I didn't, I was maybe thinking it would be more abstract and not characters. And so I was like, I don't know if I like the little boy. And now he's like, in my mind, kind of the mascot of the deck. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's just so, the hang one is just, you know, in my mind, just being so resistant on some level yeah. to change. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there is that, and it's, it can be a little childish. So I love yeah. her interpretation of it. Um, yeah. I, obviously it's a little more complicated than that, but yeah, I think just, I, yeah. there is this sort of um, tongue in cheek comedy that I hope comes through in the deck consistently. So I oh, think 100%. It's a yeah. yeah, no, I love that as a picky eater because there's a sense of block, blockness and spaces and unwillingness to move forward into something that's uncertain or unknown. And that's, that's, the hanged one, hanged man in, in a nutshell, right? Which I think is, is awesome. Yeah, and we talked about death and compost and cycles and the energy that goes into that, which I, I just love it. Um, and then the temperance is a mirepoix. So tell me about that. For me, temperance always comes up when I need to get back to basics in some mm -hmm. level or strip, yeah. you know, the balance in the middle. And I mean, I do think there is an element I, I don't, no, you lose sight when you get some level of expertise of where mm -hmm. other people stand. So yeah. maybe it's informative to people who are new to that, but they know they've definitely cut it. They just didn't know it was called that. So, you yeah. know, the scallions, the onions, the carrots. Yeah. Um, and so an element of like, all right, how do you think about your foundations again? Like, what is the foundation mm -hmm. of this dish? What is the foundation of your life? How do you get back to the building blocks? Because if you've lost mm -hmm. sight of that, you can always pick it back up. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love that because that's the core basis of so many recipes. It's like that foundation, right? Which is, which is so great. Um, and then I love that the devil is junk food. Like that encapsulates the energy of that in such a beautiful, like he's a tongue in cheek way, but it really is. It's that temptation that like giving into 
thermal base or impulses or whatever, you know, like, I, I love that you chose junk food for that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's so fun. I love junk food. It's fun. And I love yeah. doing it to the devil. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a little bit of permission, but it's also like, yeah. well, don't spend too much time there. You know? Yeah. Well, and I feel like the devil kind of gets this bad rap as like temptation and vice, but it's also sometimes really helpful to pull that card and explore like, where can you find a bit more ease with this? Like, where can you indulge your passions? Where can you let loose a little bit? Right. And, and sometimes it's so satisfying to just go and buy a bag of Oreos or go and buy, buy a bag of covered bridge chips. And it just came out with this great flavor that's like spicy and sweet jalapeno. And like the amount of joy that we get from having that is just lovely. And it's something we can do together. You know, like there, there is a magical aspect of that that is really lovely. So um, I love that you included that. It's amazing. Um, there's, the, there's that Augustine line where it's like, uh, Lord, make me pure, just not yet. Like, like that thing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we talked a bit about the burnt souffle earlier. Um, so where did that card come from? I, I love it. And what was the kind of, yeah, idea behind that? Um, I just wanted an element of drama. I like because souffles are very timed for those who may yeah. not know, but I like the element of drama where it's just, you feel like the world has ended, but because mm -hmm. it, it does you put a lot of work and time but I, I yeah. at the end of the day it's just food and yeah. so I think something more that that conversation about oh it's just food you know okay yeah. you burn to souffle like start yeah. over that so that yeah. comedy was really evident in that card and yeah. that was an early piece that came into play and I feel like I just didn't want to over that's when I'm really glad I didn't overthink because if yeah. I overthought it I never would have come up with a card Oh, I think, I think it's brilliant. Like that whole concept of burnt souffle and the opportunity to start again. Like it, yeah, it's a bummer. You poured the time and energy into it, but there's nothing to say that you can't just start over again, right? Like it, there's always that opportunity and that's so much of the energy of the tower card, okay? Things have fallen apart. You're disappointed. It didn't turn out the way you planned. So where do you go from here, right? How do you pick up the pieces and move on? How do you make something of this as a learning experience or growth experience, right? And that's so much the energy of that. I love it. And I love that you have the star as an herbalist. That's yeah. such a beautiful card too. I love it. Thank you. I, yeah, I, th I think a big element of this deck and I don't, I'm not a trained herbalist. I, maybe at some point I will be, but I think yeah. finding ways I really think the future, especially with the way Amer in America and probably internationally FCA supplements are going, like, yeah. if you want to add herbs, you're going to have to add them into your food. Yeah. Um, and so it was really important that I highlight the herbalist in some way and see it yeah. as a, a form of that. And I think it's, if we're talking about like a deep healing, mm -hmm. that's a huge element of this card. So I, mm -hmm. I think tying herbalism into food is a long-term goal of mine and finding a way to highlight that. Yeah, huge. And it's similar here in Canada, like there's a lot of restrictions and regulations on what you can and can't do. So after I did my um, herbal apprenticeship, I was so excited about coming up with tea blends and making salves and everything else. But then you can't make any kind of health claims around it. You can't say that it's like a relaxing tea or, you know, whatever else. So it, it kind of restricts how you engage with it. And rightly so, because a lot of people think, well, it's just herbs, but they are, are very powerful in a lot of respects. So it's necessary to um, approach them with that level of respect but yeah it's um there's a healing energy to it that I think is really amazing and it it's very nurturing and yeah I just love that um okay so the moon is mystery meatloaf that's fabulous tell me more about that yeah I liked the idea I, there was more than one card where I thought about I had the image of like a lunch lady in my mind yeah, I yeah. had it for um the queen of swords where it's like no yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no more yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, I liked the idea of that sort of Americana hesitancy and that comedy yeah. came back. And um, yeah. I think the image that Nisa drew with the, the young girl in the background really did give off this like moon landing sort of feeling. Yeah. To me. Like, I don't know how she encapsulated that so well in this image. Um, yeah. yeah, I just think making it fun. Um, yeah. And we all have that thing where it's like, oh, or it's, for instance, <laughs> My big vice, I don't eat a lot of meat. Most of the meat I do eat comes from shoots and stuff like that where it would get thrown out. But yeah. I do have a weakness, or I did in my youth, for spam. Mm -hmm. And I was so frightened of spam forever. I was like, that's <laughs> disgusting. Um, no, I'm mistaken. Spam's delicious. So, like, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It's funny yeah. how you come up with these ideas about certain foods and then when you actually try it, it's like, oh, actually that's quite delicious. And like you move past the blocks you had and it's it's like a celebration of a new thing, right? But then there is also that like I love that it encapsulates that mystery element, that kind of unknown component of the moon, right? Like it just like yeah, I, I I love that interpretation of that card so so much. And then the sun as the Nona, that's so beautiful. It's like bringing together food and traditions and like the happiness that you get when you cook with someone close to you. It's such a beautiful interpretation of that. Yeah, so um, I very much so associate the color yellow, which has always been my color. I've been told like my aura is yellow. Yeah, often. yeah. Not, I mean, I know not always, but um, yeah. so I... And it's interesting because I I realized that yellow is also a connection to my grandmother, um, oh, and so I think that there's this element of like uh, both like wisdom and childlike energy and nurturing. Yeah. So I do, and that is I know that's a card that Nisa really loved drawing too. Yeah, I think, yeah. and there's not a lot of need for ex over explanation. Yeah, it's so clear what the meaning of that is, and it just feels so nurturing. It feels, yeah, it really encapsulates that sun energy beautifully. Um, and then judgment has the ante. Tell me more. Um, I had this image of family who's been around our entire life and who yeah. we love and trust, but whose whose opinion we're a little frightened of sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> where you just they're gonna tell it like it is, yeah. and you and you do often run into them at feasts, like yeah. at these big oh, family yeah, things. So like right before the end, there's this hesitancy where it's like, oh, like. Are we going to have to talk about this thing with this person, with my auntie? Um, yeah. So, like, uh, I thought that there was something sort of comic about it. But I also think there's this element when we're talking about the Nona or the kids. Like, I wanted, um, and we've also discussed the ways, like, restaurants and uh, mm -hmm. nature are integrated into the deck. Family is also such an important part about food. Um, and one of the foundations of our lives. So I think it yeah. coming in to tie in near the end was really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that so much. And then the feast of the world that is just so beautiful. And I love that illustration so much. Like there's so many different elements that come into play there and it's really, really lovely. Yeah, I, I love the illustration she had. And I do think there is a feast is a natural sense of completion and joy. Wow. Um, yeah. it, yeah, yet again, that was that was a piece that was very easy to come into place. Yeah, and so often feasts come in during transition times around the holidays, you know, like you look at a lot of people's um, Christmas or, you know, Yule celebrations are centered around food and people coming together and sharing a feast and appreciating each other's company and that kind of marks the transition between one stage into another, right? And I, yeah, that's, that's such a beautiful card for that. It's really, really lovely. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask you also, what are some of your favorite cards from the deck? Like major arcana, minor arcana? Um, I know we touched on a few, but I was just wondering if there was any that you feel particularly drawn to. Um, I think the Nona is a big one, yet again, because the family, the grandmother element, mm -hmm. that is big on my mind. Um, yeah. I think some of the, the oysters cards, I would say, yet again, the nine of pentacles I already discussed. I think that yeah. one's a really special one. Yeah. Um, insofar as, oh, I love the truffle hog for the queen of um, mushrooms, yeah. because I, I loved the opportunity to bring in some, I think if there are maybe follow up at decks at some point, maybe, because there's so many other routes to go with food or boost yeah. or whatever. So maybe that'll come anywhere into play. But um, yeah, I, I like that image. That was an image I was very excited when I finally got to see it. Um, oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, it's so nice when you can include different elements like that. Like it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I would say Mystery Meatloaf, Nomina, some of the later minor arcana cards, or major yeah. arcana cards stick out in particular. And then, um, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, were there any cards that you struggled with at all? Um, I struggled, I think, most... Like I said, the emperor is always a struggle, but it was, it was an easy one to write, but that was a struggle to come up with. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say I struggled so much as things just maybe sometimes took a little more time, like we said. So um, <laughs> allowing myself the space and the compassion to step back for a second and then come, come back to it later. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was a big part of that. Um, and then um, 
I would say the tools were the last element to come into play. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot, I would say more in my mind, I was not so much worried about the writing, but um, Misa would, I was like, I hope that this isn't going to be too challenging to communicate. So I don't know if she would answer the question very differently than I would, but um, she she yeah. pulled it off greatly. I was very, very happy with what she did. So. That's amazing. So how did you two come to work together? Was she someone that you knew ahead of time? Like what was, what brought you two together for the deck? So we live maybe two miles. She lives in Greenpoint and I live in the Lower East Side and we have still not met in person because for, I mean, I love Greenpoint, but it's actually kind of challenging to get to. And um, yeah. I mean, we're busy people. But so she, sorry, my phone is, I'm going to plug it in and chat with you. I'm switching rooms, <laughs> costume change. Sounds good. Um, here. Yeah, I have my phone um, completely die on me during, during Mercury retrograde, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, there was no warning. It just basically shut down in the middle of a live. So yeah. I just plug mine in too. Just I, I have a fully charged, but I just to be on the safe side. <laughs> it's, it's very yes, it's very important. Yeah, Mercury retrograde is always. Um, oh, so we've never met in person. Um, she, I had a friend. When I say this thing was ready to go, it was ready to go. I had a friend who made a wonderful uh, literary food magazine zine Ooh. called uh, Milky a few years ago. Yeah, and uh, it was great. And she yeah. doesn't do that now, but she'll do something great at some point. And so I called my friend Emily and I said, had you worked for, with an, for an illustrator for that project? Yeah. And she said, um, no, I haven't, but she works at um, Food 52. And she was like, I have a, a friend who works here with me and she makes really cute stuff. Um, Nisa, my illustrator, as I said, had been a yeah. line cook before and that was a really important part of it and I did see yeah. this um there was one image in particular I scrolled through her Instagram and it was she, this clever she has that very tongue-in-cheek thing like I said where mm -hmm. um it was a tale of like I think it was called a tale of two oysters or something like that oh, and it does, yeah so it was like a, an oyster and then out of the oyster was growing an oyster mushroom and so it oh, really my kind God. of was like a like a message through time and space and I was like oh well oh, okay. and she was she was down right away so that was it was that fell in to I didn't ask for anyone else we yeah. did one image test we did two image test runs and we were yeah. both ready to go wow that's so fabulous isn't it amazing when you pull something together and things just kind of fall into place like I, I'm always so astounded when that happens but I feel like it's such an indicator that you're moving in the right direction when those things come together with ease like that you know it's really a uh, powerful process. That's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah her illustrations are gorgeous. Yeah, I love what, and I just think it's funny that you, like, I, or at least I, but I think most people spend so much time, like, trying to force certain things, and then the things that you're supposed to do happen. <laughs> like yeah, that. yeah, and it's almost in spite of all of your best efforts, you know, it just kind of, yeah, um, I'm always so astounded when that happens, and I really shouldn't be at this point, because it's happened enough that, you know, I should trust the process, but as a reforming type A, that level of trust is sometimes challenging. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the specs for the deck, and it's on Kickstarter until November 4th, so just another not quite week, I think. Um, and then uh, it's 78 cards structured around the Rider Waite Smith, um, and then uh, you have a detailed guidebook with suggested food and er herbs for each card, standard tarot size, 350 GSM with a smooth matte finish. And one of the aspects that I love about this deck so much is that you're going with an environmentally friendly printer. So tell me more about that process. Um, yet again, it's been, I mean, it's a tricky supply chain time. I hope I've had it things well, so we'll see how it goes. But yeah. um, the tarot community is incredible in yeah. divulging their information. They're so generous with their time. Yeah. And, um, somebody who I reached out to very early was um, a, a deck creator who made this incredible deck called the Pacific Northwest Tarot. Oh my God, Brendan Mar Marnell, yeah. right? Oh yeah. my God, he, he's incredible. I love him so much. And that deck is just, it's beautiful. Oh, from, from the first time I saw the, the first illustration, I was like, oh my God, like that, it just speaks to me on such a deep level. And he's just such a lovely human. And 
I'm so glad you were able to connect with him because he's fabulous. That's that's so great. Yeah, he and also, I mean, I don't, I like am hesitant to call, well, I've already done, and Kevin J. Stanton of Botanica were both like yeah. were the most generous kind detail um, yeah. But um, Brendan Marnell said to me about, he was like, hey, I asked him about printers. He said, I'm going with this printer. I am here are other people who I had really good communications with. But yep. also, he put the bee in my bonnet pretty early. He was like, uh, there's this great uh, printer in Italy. They yep. have all these amazing environmentally friendly specs. Yep. It will cost you more money you yep. could build, if you wanted, build it into your deck. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it is. it does mean that I am taking, you know, if we talk about Amazon and all these big companies and the things they're doing, yeah. Are we willing to make the same cuts? Are we willing yeah. to do the same things? And are we willing to spend more for something of quality? And so it was yeah. important for me, if this is something I'm going to continue to pursue in various ways that I start in a foundation that I thought was uh, of integrity. Absolutely. Well, that was one of the things that I noticed most and I, I respect because you look at the discounted rates that you get on large producers like Amazon and it's not reflective of the true cost involved at all. And um yeah. And, and I mean, as, as in terms of price point, I mean, you're retailing on Kickstarter for, I think, $60 US. That's still a very reasonable price for a tarot deck, especially an indie print. And you still manage to facilitate eco-friendly printing, which is, I think, incredible. Um, and I'm, I'm super impressed. That's, that's so awesome. And I think it's something that needs to come into consideration more because there's so many decks that are coming out continually. And anytime I see something that has an eco-friendly perspective, I think I celebrate because that's, that's such an important part of the process, especially when you look at how many are constantly being generated. Right. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, and I'm so glad that you had that correspondence with other people in the community. And it was so positive. Like I, I really have found that within the tarot and astrology community, there's so much support and encouragement and it really does feel it's kind of reaffirmed my faith in social media and the power of connection from a distance, you know, like it's a very different feel. Um, and I just wanted to go through your Kickstarter tiers too. Um, so you have the base tier, which has the deck and the guidebook and a wooden bookmark, which is super exciting. Um, and then you also have a hundred dollar um, tier that comes with the base offerings, a deck guidebook and wooden bookmark. And then you also have an altar cloth, which I think you mentioned was based on the design for the backs of the cards. It is. That's exactly yeah. right. So it's a, yeah. a little more elaborate. It's a yeah. little more fun. Um, but yeah. we really love those images and just pushing them yeah. through. I am today going to go shop around the garment district and Ooh. find cloth. So that's exciting. Oh, um, that's so exciting. Yeah. And then the, the cocoa also comes in that um, package. So that... Yeah is and uh so i'm making that by hand it, that was an idea i have friends who make uh who forage adaptogens and do a great job but in general i was trying to find ways how do i bring something of value and my friend a good friend of mine was like you know you post your reishi cocoa online and like i would definitely buy that so uh, um, absolutely such a yeah. beautiful combo too like reishi and cocoa blend together absolutely beautifully. I was so excited when I saw that you had that as a component because um, it's delicious and it's also nurturing and soothing and really lovely because um, Reishi is one of those really great stress relievers. And I mean, who doesn't need a stress reliever at this point in the COVID pandemic and just life, right? So that's, that's amazing. Yeah, and I think the idea of like food and beverage and ritual and really like yeah. bringing that home. And then insofar mm -hmm. as the wooden bookmark, so my partner is also a chef, but he has a diverse number of other interests. Mm -hmm. So he, yeah. um, he, we have a laser printer in the basement mm -hmm. or a laser cutter rather. So he, awesome. it was like, how do we work with what we already have? And he, yeah, yeah so the design is really great. We have the chef, because the, you know, this herbal, the culinary and the herbalist are both on the, the um, bookmark. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, that is so cool. Um, yeah, I, I love that you have all of these different elements included. And then there's also um, another tier that you have, which is at $1,000, but it's eight copies of everything to share with friends and a custom cooking class. So tell me a bit more about that. That's a very intriguing tier. 
I think, yeah, I, um, I think if we're talking about community and bringing things home, um, the easiest way to do that is with a coven. We're talking about kitchen witchery. And yeah. so that, you know, inviting all your friends in that capacity, yeah. that's great. And it really is great value because I teach, a, I've taught a lot of these classes online and to get mm -hmm. a class customized to something either that you wanted to learn if we wanted to just do a, I've been doing a lot of spell casting through soup classes Ooh, recently. I love so, that. Yeah. And people just using what's in their kitchen. But if you wanted to do it around a specific archetype, we could do that too. So mm -hmm. really making a class that's fitted to you. And I, I can assure you that you will learn something from the class, even if you're a good cook mm -hmm. insofar as uh, yeah. language, like even just, I know, I mean, I spent probably four years still asking people to cut onions in front of me, you know what I mean? Like, just oh, absolutely. so yeah, yeah that's, oh, that's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Custom cooking classes, like that's, that's huge. And what a special ritual to create. And especially when you're bringing groups of friends together like that, like there's something so magical in, in community, right. And, and just that custom perspective on, on food. It's really amazing. So do you have, um, like if people are interested in coming to find out more about your cooking classes, where would they find you for that? Uh, they could go to my website, herbalandspice.com. At this point, I don't have any workshops listed um, currently, but they could email me there. Yeah. I think there will be a longer format course in January where we just go through the gamut. And I also offer um, on a limited value just because my schedule changes so much. Yeah. Uh, 20 minute readings for $25 where you open your fridge and I just tell you a little bit about yourself, but it's kind of a fun way in, but we could pull cards instead if that's what you wanted, or if you just wanted yeah. to troubleshoot things in your kitchen, awesome. we could talk about that all day. So it's a really good way to sort of get to know me and what I offer. Yeah, and I love that blending of food and tarot. Like like I said, I'm kind of trying to channel that myself to find my way back to my passion and my joy, right? And that's such a beautiful blend. Um, of discipline, I guess, for lack of a better word. Oh, that's lovely. Um, so and then um, you also have your Instagram account, which is at herbal and spice, right? That's or, true. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so people can track you down on there. This is so exciting. And as I mentioned, there's just a little under a week. What's November 4th? Is that next Thursday? Next Thursday. Yep. Um, a, week from, okay. a week and like three hours from now. Yes. <laughs> That's so exciting. Yeah, well, this this deck is incredible. Like the more time I spent looking at it, the more excited I got about it because there's so many different elements that you've incorporated. And like you said, there's that sense of levity and that tongue in cheek approach, which is so, as someone who tends to take themselves too seriously, like that is much needed and really welcome. And, you know, I think with tarot, there's also ideas about traditional structures and this is the meaning of the card and I think when you can play around with that a little bit and find some levity I think it's really powerful to form a deeper connection with the practice and the cards so that's really incredible and yeah your reishi cocoa blend is also very exciting um, that's really cool that you're including that as one of the components it's really really exciting thank you so much yeah I'm, I really I put a lot of my I mean I, everyone who comes out here I'm sure and anyone who's ever you know a, a lot of myself went into this and I'm really proud of what I've done so. oh absolutely and you should be it's it's absolutely stunning um so one last question actually um the card backs um I noticed that you had shown them in the um campaign and so what's the illustration that's on the back there there's an egg in the middle right Yes, you know what? I'll pull it right now. I when I moved, I left it. Well, Sounds great. Here on the they also we have the altar cloth, the larger. Oh, one. that's so great! I love the skillet and then all the different veggies and different foods around it. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. Do you know? Uh, it's not. I don't think it's a very popular deck, but Tarot del Fuego. That was like okay. a big inspiration for um, when we were talking about like when Nisa was like, well, what do you like? I, I yeah. that stuff. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's not one that I have, but I'm going to be checking into it now. That's that's really cool. Yeah, it's a beautiful aesthetic, and her artwork is just stunning, and I love how everything comes together. And I noticed that you brought that yellow component into the backs of the cards as well, which is... She did that awesome. naturally. I didn't bring oh, up really? yellow. She she kind of just knew, and I was like, oh, I'm so yeah. relieved. Um, so yeah. that, that was cool how we there was some melding of the mind. I didn't have to ask for yellow. 
Yeah. Well, that sense of synchronicity when you're working with someone who you're on the same wavelength with, like there's something so powerful about that. Like I've collaborated with a few people over the past year where it's just like you're on the same wavelength and you come up with ideas and they seem to somehow align even without planning it. And there's something so magical about that process, which is super awesome. Oh, that's Thank so great. You. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about your deck. This has been so awesome and such a pleasure being able to ask you all the questions because as I was going through and looking at the different cards, I was so curious about everything. And it was such a treat to be able to chat with you about all of this and get some insight on everything to do with the deck. It's really quite magical. So thank you for that. I'm so honored that you would have me. Thank you so oh, much. Gosh. Um, and I, I will maybe get in touch with you because I'd love to chat with you more about your, your food practices. They sound amazing. Yeah, no, that would be wonderful. I'm up for that anytime. And I'll be posting this to uh, IGTV. So anyone who missed a portion of this or, or didn't have a chance to watch it with us live, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, go and check out the replay. Um, so yeah, I'll be doing that shortly. Thanks so much, Jules. Thank Have you so much. Day. Such a pleasure. <laughs> Have a good day, okay? Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.